Good morning. My name is Larry Stone. I'm the safety manager for Ecotech Waste out of Jeffersonville, Indiana. We service the greater Louisville area. Now, my background, I started in the fire service in 1972, Crosby Township. In 75, I went to Coleraine. That's when Coleraine and Dunlap merged. and was on Coleraine's department until 1991. I was also a police officer, started doing that in 79 in Coleraine as well. But that was all part-time. My full-time job, I was the safety director at a large trash company in the area, and I did that for 40 years. I retired from there in 2013. I moved to Florida, and I found out real, real quick that it's hot down there, so I moved back up here into the freezing tundra. And uh, I think I'm ready to go back, but nevertheless, I'm here. The purpose of this training is to talk about some awareness for compressed natural gas vehicle fires. What I learned about 15, 16 years ago when we first brought compressed natural gas vehicles into our fold, that we did some studies and uh, Chief uh, Randy Ellert from Coleraine and I did a lot of stuff together to learn the safety of these vehicles. Essentially, they're very, very safe, but when there is a fire, we've seen some stuff in the field that I think will, will seriously injure a firefighter or critically injure a firefighter at the scene if you're not aware what to look for. My goal today is to expose you to some risk issues because every fire scene is different. If I expose you to enough of these risk, is risk issues, you'll be able to identify them on, on your own. So if you would play this first video, this happened in the uh, uh, Midwest. Stop it right there. That cylinder is a class four cylinder, just like your SCBA, but it's very, very heavy. In fact, these things, uh, you can run a D8 over these things and they, they won't harm them, except for the transition points where the valving is. That's their weakest point. But that, that uh, canister will stand a D8 dozer running over top of it. It's just like your SCBA, again, only it's bigger. These things are about 72 inches long in most cases on the truck. So what happened in this situation, um, let's go back to, well, I'll tell you what, we'll talk about that in just a second. Go forward a little bit more. Go. That school was three quarters of a mile away. The explosion was so violent, I'm going to show you what happened. Stop it. That tank flew to the back of that school. Now let's examine what happened here. That's a, res that's a uh, front loader trash truck. The load was on fire inside the truck. When the engine company arrived on the scene, the officer was told it's a compressed natural gas vehicle. He gave the instruction, the command to cool the tanks. So what happened was they had two hand lines shooting water up on both sides of this truck. The seat of the fire was still going, still cooking. On the ends here are pressure relief devices. If I say a pressure relief device to a firefighter, you're thinking gets to a certain pressure and relieves the product. They don't work that way. These work off of temperature. They release at 218 degrees. So imagine we've got a deep-seated fire inside the truck that's going, and they're throwing water up here, cooling the pressure relief devices. Inadvertently, they allow this thing to continue to cook until it explodes. That was the reason that they had the explosion. That was not supposed to happen. So let's go to the next video. This happened on the East Coast, and as you can see, it torched that house. So let's examine what happened in this situation. Same scenario, we had a vehicle fire. Now, there's two types of vehicle fires in the waste industry that I've investigated over the years. One is a cabin chassis fire, and the other is a load fire. Load fires happen every day. If we took everything that we had in our garages, just with a small group, put it in a pile, and then squeeze it together, we're going to get a chemical reaction most of those chemical reactions create, create heat. When that truck starts going down the road, that's why we see it on our interstates more often than not. So now you've got heat going on inside the truck, you've got plenty of fuel, all the voids in the truck create a bellows. So now you're blowing oxygen into a superheated surface with plenty of fuel, you have spontaneous combustion. That's your typical load fire. This was a cabin chassis fire. They say it started because of a hydraulic leak. Now, I can take a match and drop it into a bucket of hydraulic oil and the match will go out. But if you atomize hydraulic oil, put it in a spray bottle, 
has a very, very low flash point. They believe that's what happened with this situation. That was the start of the fire. So when the fire department arrived, the thing was already in full bloom and it already torched the house. But this, what I want you to remember is this is predictable behavior. So what happened in this scenario, the pressure relief devices reached 218 degrees, it released the product and torched that house. That house is 55 feet away from that truck. So imagine if you will, you pull up and that thing is involved but it hasn't released yet. Imagine if you will, we were dispatched to a vehicle fire and you pulled up and you see this thing fully involved before the pressure relief device is released. More than likely, we would have done the same thing that that Midwest apartment did and started throwing hand lines on the side of that truck. So imagine if you will, we've pulled up here, we've got hand lines out because the PRDs have not released yet, and then this happens. Imagine if you're standing there and that release takes point. This, ladies and gentlemen, is predictable behavior. You can expect this to happen. The question is, where are the pressure relief devices pointed? And have they released yet? You're probably going to know that on arrival. If they haven't, you've got a concern for your exposures and your own personal safety. Let's go to the next video. This happened in the Midwest. Stop it right there. I can look at that truck from two or three blocks away and tell you it's a compressed natural gas vehicle. Does anybody know what I'm looking at? The top of it. You're exactly right, LT. This part up here is where the tanks are housed. I call it a canopy. So when I see that on arrival, my size up is going to change because now I'm worried about those PRDs releasing. I've got an exposure problem. Now you saw vehicles driving past this. Now, Stone said that these things release at 218 degrees and we see a working fire right here. We know a match burns at 1200 degrees. If these things are going to release at 218, why haven't they released yet? The only thing I can tell you is that this is in northern Indiana. It's on a colder day. And any time you have a fire, you have a thermal lift. So it's actually pulling ambient air across those pressure relief devices and artificially keeping them cool. They never go off in this whole evolution. Where exactly are they? On there? <laughs> Great question. The tanks are up here. So we can assume that the PRDs are on both ends of that tank. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in some of the still pictures I show you. Are those fuel tanks underneath and also? This is a hydraulic tank. Okay. Good questions. Recognizing these from a distance is going to be a key. And when we're done with this, I will guarantee you the next time you're on the road, you're going to start looking at trucks so you can identify them more readily. We're going to go forward on this video a little bit. Where's the battalion chief? <laughs> he is completely in harm's way. Now this is a career department, well-trained, well-educated department, but he doesn't know what he doesn't know. Go ahead and roll it. He does a 360, that's what we're trained to do. He's looking for risk issues, but he's unaware, totally unaware, of the compressed natural gas situation that he's involved in. Guy with the hose line, what do you think he's doing? He's not doing anything to mitigate that fire. He's actually putting water on the pressure relief devices, just like that other department did in the first video. Now the chief is going to go have a conversation with a police officer. A couple more firefighters are going to come up and have a conversation with him. And guess where they're at? Completely in harm's way, because they don't know what they don't know. Now. I'm sure what he's trying to do there is lob water into the truck and it's just not working for him. I don't think he's trying to cool the tetrahedron. So we're going to fast forward just a little bit more. Stop it for a minute. Knowing what I know about it, when I come up to one of these fires, I immediately want to call for a, a deluge situation, a deck gun of some sort. I can tell you that my old department, Cole Rain, uh, a couple of months ago, I can't remember who the BC was, but they had a trash truck fire on 275, one engine company response. Because it was a trash truck, they immediately called for a, a ladder and another engine. So what they were doing was getting 
more water on, out there and an aerial to, to make the attack. These guys did the right thing by lobbing water into there. The guy played with that hand line for two minutes and 30 something seconds and did absolutely nothing to mitigate the fire. When they put the master stream on here, they had a knock on the fire in seven seconds. Go ahead and roll it. Imagine standing there with that hand line for all that time doing absolutely nothing. You need a large volume of water. This actually happened, and I'm gonna say in the Dayton, Ohio area, because after it was over, I went up and did some training with these folks. I'm gonna watch it for a second. I want you to go back to the first part of it and stop it. Okay. When I went back up to kind of do a recap on this, this situation, they come out with one engine and they had knocked the fire down two times and he kept rekindling. The battalion chief was sitting in a staff car behind there. He had called for a water truck. In the interim, the guys went back to figure out what's going on. We've knocked this fire down two times. Why is it rekindling? Let's, th let's kind of dissect this a little bit. The compressed natural uh, gas tanks are up here. From here down to a distribution box is high pressure stainless steel lines. When this thing is fully fueled, it's fueled at 3,600 PSI. But on a very hot day, that's going to expand a little bit. So that could expand to 4,000 PSI. That's your high pressure side. From here to the engine is low pressure side. Those are rubber lines. So can somebody tell me why this thing rekindled? The rubber lines were compromised, even though they had the fire knocked down because you had gas coming out of here, you had superheated metal, it reignited. So now they're waiting for a water truck to come and trying to figure out what happened. Roll it again. They were extremely lucky. This truck was at the end of its day. It had less than 150 PSI on the supply side. See how that gas is just kind of flowing out of there? It's not coming out at 3,600 PSI. That, that fire would have probably enveloped them if that was fully fueled with compressed natural gas. Something to think about. Let's go to the next one. A lot of people saw this happen up in New Jersey. Go, uh, go up to about here. Trash truck on fire, we've already talked about this. Now we don't know if it's a load fire, or cabin chassis fire. My fear is that you may see that column of flame and think that the pressure relief device has already relieved in this truck. That is the low pressure side and it's blowing gas out the low pressure side. When it gets the high pressure side, that happens. So the fire was still going on, still cooking the tanks until it exploded the tanks because it never released the PRDs. The PRDs never got the temperature. This is a cold day, obviously, with all the snow here. It blew shrapnel into the houses on the right-hand side of this video. So what are your, when you're saying the low-pressure side and the high-pressure side, where, where is that on the truck? I'm going to show you on some great question. I'm going to show you on some still pictures. Go to the next one. To give you a, an idea of how forceful this can be. Now, let's face it, everything around that's 218 degrees, agreed? But for some reason, the PRDs haven't released yet. We could arrive on the scene and start setting up our ground attack. Go fast forward just a little bit. A little more. And that happens. That can blow like that for seven to 10 minutes, depending on the amount of fuel left in the vessel. And it will blow for up to 100 feet. If you see a decal, this is what it's going to look like today. I'm on a committee with the solid waste industry that I'm, we're trying to change that decal to make it a little more prominent. When I first tried to change the decal, there was some concern that we were going to scare the public. My concern is saving the life of a firefighter. I want to see something on all four sides. Now, that decal is not required. 
It's not required because it's the primary fuel source for that vehicle. I mean, we don't have a gasoline sticker on our cars because it's a primary fuel source, it's not required. If they were carrying it as a commodity, then it would have to be placarded with the DOT placarding. If that sticker was on this truck, would you see it? Probably not. A lot of trash trucks are used as multiple billboards. But I show this picture also to identify, can we tell from a distance it's a compressed natural gas vehicle? We see the tanks up on top. They've got a little signage on the side there. We can assume that the pressure relief devices are here because those are access points for them. Doesn't have to have those holes in it. It can have a uh, compartment that will couple screws and you come down and you can access them. A lot of them have those access points just like this one. Next one. This is what the tanks look like when they're on the truck. Very much like a cascade system that many of us still have. The only difference is all these valves are on simultaneously. The only time they're turned off if the vehicle goes into the garage for some sort of maintenance. Now this is what the CNG distribution box looks like. And we'll get to that, that low pressure, high pressure side in a minute. Now, again, these decals are not required. That's what it looks like when it comes out from the factory. Six months in, a year in, you might not even see those decals. But the box is going to look very, very similar. Next one. This is what it looks like on the inside. You got your high pressure side, low pressure side. Remember, low pressure is rubber lines going to the engine. High pressure is your supply side, stainless steel, high pressure lines going to the tanks. This valve turns it off from the supply to the engine. Trash truck drivers are trained. If you have a vehicle fire, the first thing you do is this. Don't go after the fire extinguisher first. Turn off the supply. Now, will they do that? Trash truck drivers, UPS drivers, home city ice drivers, they're not trained firefighters. When they see fire, the adrenaline pumps up, they get a little panicky. I'm not going to count on them to turn that valve off. But that's what turns it off. We're going to talk about that valve a little bit more in another slide. Next one. Another picture of the uh, truck that blew up in uh, the Midwest. Next one. In the trash industry, we train the drivers when they have a load fire to dump the load. That's a $350,000 truck. I would rather them go to a secure parking lot, blacktop area, dump the load. Even if we have to remediate the blacktop, $15,000, $20,000, you've saved a $350,000 truck. Plus, we've negated the fact that those tanks may blow up if that fire keeps uh, deep-seated fire underneath those tanks. So the next one. This is what it looks like when you roll up. You see that uh, fire in the middle of a parking lot. They, uh, next one. You put out the fire. Next one. The company comes and cleans it up. No harm, no foul. So it's not a big deal. Next one. This is what one of the fueling stations look like. This one happens to be up in northern Ohio. When I did the training with this department, they were completely unaware of these risk issues as well. Today, the department is right around the corner. They take their little golf cart thingy and drive down here whenever they see somebody fueling up because every one of these vehicles and manufacturers have a better idea and they're all different. So they want to see a variety of tanks, how they're mounted, where the pressure relief devices are, and where the distribution boxes are. Next one. You or I can theoretically walk up, put our credit card in this, and dispense gas. The difference being is that that hose has a ball valve in it, and so does the tank on the receiving side. Those things have to meet up for the gas to flow. So we really couldn't do that. My fear is that some guy's going to be on the road one day with his family. He left wherever, and he's driving down I-75. And when he last fueled up, the check valve on his side popped out or there was a fallacy with it. When he gets here, he's out of fuel. He's going to find some way to make that fuel flow. My fear is they're going to stick stuff in there. But it's never happened yet. These things have been in place for 30 years. Maybe I'm being a little bit uh, too overcautious, but it hasn't happened yet. Next one. This is in uh, Hamilton, Ohio. Currently, Hamilton has about 
20 some vehicles that are compressed natural gas in their municipal fleet. This too is open to the public. I show you this because when this was first installed, the price of gas, the equivalence was $1.99. For seven years, it's still been $1.99, hasn't changed. So as our fuel prices go up and down, that's a pretty stable fuel cost within the, the C&G industry. Next one. This is up in uh, Dayton, Ohio. And uh, again, when I did the training with this department, now they come up and they look at a lot of different vehicles because the tanks are different in a lot of trucks. The configuration for the pressure relief devices are different. The more you learn before the joker goes off, the safer you're gonna be when it, when it does. Next one. I've done this training for quite a few years. In fact, my initial training was published in Fire Chief Magazine in 2016. At that point, I said, I don't see mom and pop fleets going to this type of fuel because you got to train your mechanics, you got to have a different uh, fueling system, and you got to have the availability of the fuel. So as I'm going down I-75 one day out of Dayton, I see this truck called M&M Carding. I don't know M&M Carding from anybody, so I'm thinking it's a mom and pop company. Next one. I get up alongside and sure enough it's compressed natural gas. I've later learned that this is a very large company in uh, Louisville, Kentucky area. Most of their fleet is compressed natural gas. That's a different configuration than what I've seen before, so I wanted to make sure that I took a picture of that to show you. When you start assuming until you know, could, could have the wrong assumption. Next one. This particular one is located not too far from here, and the department where this is located, they were aware of the fueling site, but they hadn't seen these risk issues before. They kind of went and did a completely new pre-plan once they saw this facility. After I did my training, I got a call back about an hour later and said, hey Stone, that facility is right here in our own backyard for M&M carding. It's right here in the Hamlin County area. Next one. I was up in Troy, Ohio and I saw this Home City ice truck and I saw that compartment back there and I'm thinking, I don't think that's compressed natural gas compared to what I'm used to looking to. It's very, very small. So I took a closer look. Next slide. On the back side, I saw diesel only. So I'm thinking, it's probably diesel fuel. The driver was coming out, and I said, I'm oh, just looking at your truck. I see it's a diesel powered truck. And he says, yeah. But the, the compressed natural gas, the diesel was for the refrigeration unit. The compressed natural gas fuels the vehicle, the engine. So this is a compressed natural gas vehicle. The guy was quickly to show me, next one. There's a decal right here in the back. Imagine, if you will, we get a call for a vehicle fire, so we got a cabin chassis fire, and we pull in from this side. Think you're gonna see that? Probably not. The other thing is that we're gonna set up our ground attack because we got a cabin chassis fire. We're probably gonna go around here to set up our ground attack up here. But that means we're gonna pass this truck, not knowing where the pressure relief devices are, and set up our ground attack. If I see that decal, I'm taking my engine company and I'm going completely around to set up my ground attack. And then I've got to worry about exposure because the grocery store is right here. And I got everybody in the store taking a video. That's what we see more often than not. Next one. I show you this tank just to give you an idea. When you're driving down the road and you see a long tank like this, I don't need to see a decal. That's equivalent to a 120 gallon diesel tank. Average truck is gonna use about 55 to 60 gallons in a day. That's overkill for diesel. So I'm gonna make the assumption that's compressed natural gas until I know differently. Next one. Location of the distribution box on this type of truck. They're all different. I see that box, I know exactly what it is. This is a hydraulic tank, that's your battery box. Next one. On this truck, the tailgate, is where the compressed natural gas tanks are. You would not know that because of my relationship in the, in the solid waste industry. I see this panel back here on the tailgate. Normally that's full of garbage. But because I see this inspection panel, I know that's a CNG vehicle. I don't need to see a decal. You probably won't know that. Next one. The good thing about the newer models, voluntary compliance, the waste industry, are venting the gas vertically, 45 degree angles and vertically. None of the horizontal stuff anymore that we've seen in the earlier pictures. Next one. 
Well, that one got upside down. There we go. This is another configuration of tailgate. We can see the C and G, but then we can see all these inspection panels. That's where the valving is for the pressure relief device. Next one. Here's another configuration. This is the company that I work for. This is where the compressed natural gas tanks are. This is the distribution box. Next one. Another configuration. We've seen that on top already. That's where the valving is on top. We see the distribution box. Again, that's where my red valve is, is hidden. Next one. This was a fire on the interstate outside of Louisville in one of our trucks. The fire started on the passenger side underneath the dash. Fire department got there. They used their 500 gallons of water very, very quickly, but the fire was still going. The driver said he turned off the red valve immediately. Not sure if he did or not. He was scared. Next one. Because they were out of water, I kind of advised the battalion chief that I would call for a ladder and do an aerial attack and incoming water be used in that manner. There was some discussion about how they were going to put manpower up against that truck to try to extinguish the fire. I said, Chief, I don't care if we lose that truck. I would rather not see you put a firefighter at risk to save that truck. There was no other risk around. So then we brought in the, the ladder and was able to extinguish it uh, with using the ladder. Next one. That's when she was fully glowing. Next one. If we were dispatched to a vehicle fire and we pulled around a corner and we see that, we can safely assume that's a compressed natural gas vehicle because of the canopy up top. But what's the first thing I got to think about is exposure. Look how close it is to the houses. I know your first due. You have to know your first due. And when you get that call, what are my risk issues around there? In some cases, when you get that call, you may want to ask for law enforcement times four. Imagine, if you will, that the call is at a shopping center or a highly populated area. You don't have time to do crowd control. You're going to need law enforcement to help you with that. Next one. Another configuration. I was told that these tanks are put on in a manner that they will, they will be sheared off if you hit a low overpass. I'm not sure that I'm very really comfortable with that because these do not have check valves in them. Therefore, if it gets sheared off, now you've got all that gas just flowing freely. You could have an ignition source and have a bigger problem. I look at this truck and I can tell it's a compressed natural gas vehicle. What am I looking at? Canopy on top and I see the holes up on top. Now, I might assume that the PRDs are right here. I might assume that the vent tube is going to be in that area too because this looks like a newer truck. Problem is, this is a refurb truck. Nice chrome wheels, they repainted it, she looks pretty, but this is an older truck that's been refurbed. I have no idea if that vent tube is at a 45 degree angle or not. I won't know and, and more than likely the driver won't know. Next one. Here's the whole fleet. These are stacked tanks. We've already seen these. Something to look for. You can readily identify these now when you're out on the roadway. Next one. Another configuration of a stacked tank. My goal today is make sure that when you leave here, you start looking now that you can identify these things before the alarm goes off. Next one. Another configuration. <coughs> See the tanks right up in here. Next one. Another one. Next one. This is a couple typical uh, trash trucks. Go ahead. You see this tank on the side? Now this one doesn't have those openings on it. Like I said, if the, vent, if the t uh, valving is all on the other side and it doesn't have PRDs on both sides, this is an acceptable configuration. So it might look like that. There's that long tank that I told you about. You see that? That's equivalent to 120 gallons of diesel. That's overkill for what's called a day cab. If it doesn't have a sleeper berth in it, it's a day cab. That's overkill for fuel more than likely it's compressed natural gas. Buses started using this very early on. Now this, this stuff has been used in California for the last 30 years. I've got a couple of friends in the fire service out there. They've really never seen any problems yet. It's a safe alternative fuel. In the absence of this alternative fuel, we would be paying over $10 a gallon at the pump. I'm happy that it's here. But from a fire service standpoint, We've got to know the risk issues involved with going and responding to these type of fires. 
I like to use this one for a good example. He's got a decal on here. If we've got a cabin chassis fire, we roll up, we see this long tank, we can pretty well assume from a distance we got a cabin chassis fire. Now, there's my red valve. If that truck is on the interstate in what I'm going to call full bloom, it's not a working fire, but full bloom, I'm probably not going to go up and turn this red valve off because I don't know when those PRDs are ready to release. I can see the release point is up here, and they're going to vent at 45 degree angle. But now let's take this same truck and let's put it into a highly populated area like a nursing home, like a shopping center, like a school. I may have somebody go up and turn this red valve off to minimize the risk. In the fire service, it's a risk issue. We risk a lot to save a lot. If that truck is on the interstate in full bloom, probably not going to do anything but deluge it. Is that a single tank then when they're that big? Yes, sir. Okay. And it, but it could be tanks on both sides, but we don't know. So then would it have two valves, or is that valve typically found on the driver's side? Typically, there's going to be one valve. Great question. I've talked a lot about trash trucks, but I want to just show you this one. A lot of different fleets are using it. We saw Home City Ice. We're going to see a couple other ones. So you've got to start thinking that anybody could be using this because it's a very effective alternative fuel. UPS has used it. You see that long tank on the side? They have a little decal on there too that says compressed natural gas. Next one. But my goal is, again, to get you to start looking at these things before the alarm goes off. Next one. This is a, a route truck, so it's in the communities. Next one. This one is a LNG. See how different this one looks? But you got to start looking at these because the LNG works very, very different than the CNG. LNG is, lighter, uh, um, LNG is heavier than air, so it's going to stay on the ground. There was a fire in the European area about three months ago where the, there was a compromise to the tank. The LNG went across the interstate and got an ignition source, and then you had a wall of fire. With CNG, it's lighter than air, so it's going to dissipate. You've got to know the difference in these two when you're, when you're looking at your fire ground management. Another picture of that LNG tank, and it says LNG on the truck. God love him, he's got a CNG sticker on there, so he's in our town every day. If we have a cabin chassis fire here or a load fire in the back or brakes fire, you know, we see that CNG. Next one. This guy doesn't have a decal on it. Remember, it's not required. It's his primary fuel source. So imagine, if you will, this guy is pulling through an intersection and somebody comes up and T-bones him right there. So we got an auto accident with an entrapment person injured. First thing we do, we start looking for fuel leaks, whatever, on, on the fire side. You know, the EMS crew, the, the medics are all dealing with the injured party. Different scenario. We see this compressed natural gas. I had a person in northern Kentucky tell me, is this where you would use your uh, uh, four gas meter? No, I'm going to use this meter first because the gas is impregnated with mercaptan. Does everybody know what mercaptan is? It is the odor agent that's put in gas so we can smell it. It's lighter than air, so I'm not going to be able to stand back here and smell it. I'm going to have to walk up there and smell to see if there's a leak. Again, the tanks are very, very rigid. The impact of the car probably is not going to compromise that tank, but where could it compromise the tank? The valving. That's the weakest point. Now, if it does compromise the tank, and you got this little engine in here, the coolant keeping the truck cool, that gas could go up there. This is a thinking person's position. So there's not just cookie cutter stuff. You got to have that thinking cap on. Next one. That scares me. That's in California. I don't think there's any fleets around the Midwest that's currently using compressed natural gas for school buses, but I'm sure it's coming. <coughs> Municipalities get a, get a discount or some uh, on Clean Air uh, Act if you're using it. Here's a, uh, 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 is that a Mercedes? See, I don't know that. You all know it's an Audi because you're in Green Township. Okay. Next one. Here's a uh, police car. God love them. They got a little decal on the back. I've never seen a trunk fire, but they got a decal on it. Next one. Blow this one up a little bit, if you will. 
There you go. Okay. This is a Volkswagen. I like to make this my last one because this one's very unique. Every car manufacturer is making a compressed natural gas vehicle. It's about eight to $10,000 more, but it's cost effective on the cost of fuel, and, and they say they get good engine life and everything else. But the difference is this has a, uh, a midship pressure relief device somewhere in the tank. So what happens if you get a fire over here, theoretically, it's going to release at some point wherever the valving is. There's no decals on this car, so we're going to roll up and we'll see a, a car fire, an engine fire. It's going to be hard for us to know it's compressed natural gas. There's no decals on it. It's also going to be very difficult for us to find out where the valving is to turn off the gas and where the venting is, where the vent tube's located. My goal today is to heighten your awareness so that when you leave this training, you get on the line and start looking at different vehicles, different configurations. When you go down the road, your next run, start looking at different trucks and learn the differences in the configuration of the tanks. Next time you're on a run and you happen to see a truck out, whether it's at a shopping center or whatever, it's a compressed natural gas vehicle, go up to that driver and ask him if you can look at the distribution box, see what he knows about them. Because in many cases, they're not gonna know much. But you might heighten his or her awareness by just asking some questions. My point being is that when the alarm goes off, you roll up on the scene, and if you're not aware of what the risk issues are, you could very easily put yourself in harm's way. Any questions? Are okay. the tanks at the fueling station <coughs> above ground or below ground? Most cases, they're above ground. Uh, what's going to happen now at a fueling station? You have a reservoir, so the tank, com the gas comes right out of the ground, just like it comes to your home. But you've got this storage tank above ground, so it comes up out of the ground gets pressurized in a storage tank and then gets offloaded down to your vehicle. Good question. Is this just all re recaptured from the dumps? Is that why the waste is using it? Or is that's, that's big reason why a lot of the waste industry is using it. There's a company in uh, Michigan and in northern Indiana called Rulon Trucking and they started using it because of cow manure. Cow manure, that's a big, big dairy farm up in Michigan and the cow manure and goes into a vat, it produces methane gas. So they started generating methane gas and using it for all their trucks. Um, there's a lot of people finding different resources. Home City Ice, uh, a lot of their trucks are compressed natural gas. UPS is using a combination of compressed natural gas and LMP. Um, the other one, FedEx, they're experimenting with it. We're gonna see this growing, it's not going away. So if I were king, 911, what's your emergency? I have a vehicle fire on 275. Is anybody injured? What's the location? Is it fueled with an alternative fuel source? Can you imagine if on alarm, on dispatch, we were told, I don't get, don't get in the weeds. If it's fueled with an alternative fuel source on, on dispatch, we're gonna change our, our approach. Number one, I'm gonna ask for a ladder and a second engine, so I got a thousand gallons of water. One engine company responds, what I've learned from Florida to Michigan is the normal for a car fire, vehicle fire. That's not enough water, as you've seen the one on, on Louisville, it's not enough water to get the job done. At the fueling stations, when you said that you know, the gas comes out of the ground and it's compressed into the above ground tanks, is it strictly compressed or is it compressed down to where it's liquid? <clears throat> Don't know the answer to that one. I would like to know that. that that's, I haven't. My focus for this class has been more about the fire ground management issue, and I haven't focused a lot on the distribution. You know, when I was asked to teach this at uh, uh, FDIC, and they asked me if I could extend it to an hour and a half, I said, that's not my goal. I don't want to make technicians out of everybody here, because there is a level of that, you know, for this, this type of uh, uh, fuel system. What I want to do is make people aware on fire ground management. Yes, sir. So, how much fuel or compressed natural gas are these vehicles typically carrying? I mean, does it vary in size? Or because I know Duke's running uh, <coughs> natural gas. I mean, are we talking? It's going to burn like this for an hour. It's going to burn like this for ten minutes. If the PRD releases, it can typically blow off for seven to ten minutes. Now that's on the 
larger vessels. On a pickup truck or a passenger car, I don't know the answer to that. Now, the variable is based on a couple things. For example, if, if I'm specking out a truck and I'm going to have that truck do a long haul, I need more resident fuel. But if I'm just going to run it around town, then I need a couple tanks. Like the Home City Ice truck that we saw, they had relatively small tanks compared to what we saw with the trash trucks or even the over-the-road vehicle. Uh, this thing's going to burn like hell for <clears throat> seven minutes. You know, by the time I get a, by the time I get another truck there and get him set up, we may be getting to the end of that. You know, maybe our best bet is to. I mean, I want him coming, but I might just have to ride it out. And I'm kind of curious as to how long I'm going to have to try and ride it out. It's it's going to be that seven to ten minutes. The the, the issue the, there's such a variable here. When we get the call. How long has it been burning? We all know that people try to put them out themselves before they call us. You know, so there we could have been a, a lapse time of five, ten minutes already, and they're playing with it. Now by the time they call us, we're behind we're behind the eight ball. So all the variables, again, this is a thinking person's career. You can't just be so just pragmatic that you've got a vehicle fire on 275, it's routine. The day you start thinking any of this is routine is the day you're gonna get yourself or somebody else hurt. We all know that. Anybody else? Thank you very much for your time and attention. <laughs>